folks, let's go ahead and get started today. I'm going to share on the topic of suffering, and I've named this suffering raw and real. So I'm going to really dig into the topic of suffering today. For some of you, maybe for all of you, from a little bit different perspective than we often see in the Christian circles, and especially in the age of motivation and prosperity teaching, and and if you know if we just do this, this, and this, God blesses our lives, and and all of those things obviously are true, but many times the topic of suffering is put on the back burner. But let's face it, we've all suffered. We're probably all going to suffer again. And and that's probably going to happen no matter how closely we follow Jesus. And perhaps even more because we uh, follow him. So that's what we're really going to dig into today. I feel compelled to open this time in a little time of worship before we get started. And I'll be honest with you, this isn't natural for me for these calls. I want to come in here. I want to teach. I want to get into what I believe is a gift that God has placed inside of me. He gives me a word and I come and I do what he's made me good at naturally. And, and that's I preach. I want to enter into a time of worship that looks a lot like the time that I spend with the Lord. And and this is interesting because a few minutes ago, the Lord gave this to me and I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 God, this is great. But I'm I'm feeling a little bit of timidity here, as as we as as we're here, and I'm just gonna step right, I'm just gonna step right into it. Father, I come before you right now and I just worship you. Father, we worship you. Father, I know that I'm on screen and I'm on camera, but I want this time, I want this time to be just like it's just you and me. And, but I want this time to be more than just you and me. I want it to be just you and me and Thomas and Carrie and anybody else that's here. And Father, Father, I want to invite everybody that watches this. If you're watching this on YouTube tomorrow or next year or next decade, you know, God is timeless. The word says, God, your word says that a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. You know, and if we were to do the math, it would be kind of like a day is like a second. So wherever you're at, folks, I want you to imagine that in God, in Christ, you're right here, whether it's an hour from now or a year from now, that we're actually all right here because with God, a day is as a thousand years. Let's just join in, join in with me, worship with me. Don't just watch me here. I already feel uncomfortable enough because I've never done this before. I do this privately. Join in with me. Join in with me and worship the Lord. Father, we come before you and we're just so grateful for your presence. Father, we worship you. We thank you that you're here in the good times and the bad. Father, we thank you that we're here and that we're able to worship you. Father, we worship you. Father, we just simply want to walk in your will. We want to walk in your will and we don't want to dictate to you what your will is, whether that's blessing or poverty. Father, whether that's suffering or that's learning through the suffering or that's getting on the other side of the suffering or that's getting on the other side of the mountain or that's casting the mountain. Father, right now, I just want to humble myself and I want to, I just want to be in the center of your will, whatever that is. Because God, I've got a life and you've laid out a plan for me. The truth of the matter is I probably haven't walked in it most of the steps, but as I look at the next half of my life, God, I want to walk every step in your plan. Father, I worship you and I thank you. Thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. Father, I lift up to you, Thomas, now. And Father, whatever it is that is a burden on him right now, Father, I lift that burden up to you and I ask God that you would take, I don't ask that you take the burden away. He might want me to, but I don't ask that you'll take the burden away. But God, that your presence would be right there with him during the burden. That as long as that burden exists, that your load is light because you're able to carry it with us. Father, I lift up to you, Carrie, and I don't know what her burdens are, but God, I ask that you would walk with Carrie, that you'd walk with Carrie. 
and that you would lift that burden. Father, I just worship you. Again, just come before you and worship you. I feel so compelled to just bring you our lives right now that we could just dispense with the entire message and that we could just soak in you and that you could be not just the relief, but you could be right here with us. Fear not, for I am always with you. Lord, you didn't say fear not because I'm your strength or fear not because you have my word or fear not because I'm going to solve everything or fear not because I'm going to give you the answers. Fear not, be not dismayed because I am with you. Lord, be with us. Be with us. Lord, be with us during this time. Father, I ask that you would anoint my lips to share exactly what you had in mind three or four days ago when you gave me this passage, when you enlightened this passage to me. God, I feel like I have all of these ideas of what I should share, and yet I feel compelled right now to just open your word and read it and let it soak into the ears of the hearers. Father, direct me as I pray and direct the ears of the listeners. In Christ's name we pray, thankfully, amen. I want to get right into the word, folks. Now, we all know the story of Abraham and Sarah, and for years and years and years, they weren't able to have a son. God had promised them a son to be, to be their inheritance. God had promised them a son really to be the lineage of Christ. To, God had promised them a son that their, that, that, that their descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky, as many as the sand on the beaches, the sand in the desert. They were tired of waiting. They were tired of waiting. So I want to read Genesis chapter 16. Just start in verse 1. And I'll read and I'll comment as I believe the Lord directs. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bear him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Let's just stop right here. I, I, I want to stop right here. I want to, Lord, give me the words. How many times has God given us a promise? I'm speaking to me and you. How many times has God given you a promise? He's promised you a new house. He's promised you a new business. He's promised you a financial prosperity. He's promised you a relationship. He's promised you that somebody in your life would come to Christ. He's, he's promised you a new location. He's promised you the relief of something in your life. He's promised you a health. Like you know it deep down inside. He's promised that you're going to be a speaker on a topic. I have a business audience. We can talk about that. He's promised you that he's going to put a course in your heart to teach. He's promised you he's going to give you a stage. He's promised you that somebody is going to give you a call. And they're going to invite you onto a stage. He promised you that two years ago, five years ago, and that call hasn't come yet. And how many times when that call doesn't come, when he's promised something and the call doesn't come, and you know that that thing is going to happen, like you know in your knower, you know that you know that you know that God is going to birth something in you. You also know that he told you, create this fictional situation, that it was going to happen because someone was going to knock on your door, or someone was going to call you. You felt that deep inside, but it's been two years, it's been five years, and it's never happened. And in the back of your mind, you start thinking, well, maybe God wants me to do this. Maybe God wants me to do this. Maybe God wants me to do this. You start being like Sarah. You're like, God's given us a promise, but I'm 80 years old. God's obviously not going to do it through me. 
God's given me a promise, but the phone never rings. God's given me a promise, but he hasn't done it yet. And something inside of us does the same thing Sarah's getting ready to do. We're like, you know what? I've been around this block, God. There's this, there's this new service online. I, I can go make my own stage, God. I know you told me you were going to get a phone call one day. But God, maybe you don't understand the way the world works these days. Everybody's, everybody's doing it, God. Everybody's making their Zoom calls and everybody's going on YouTube and everybody's making their own plan. I'm just going to go do it. My mentor tells me to do it, right? I'm just going to go do it, God. God's told you to wait for a relationship and it hasn't happened. We try to make, I've done that before. We try to make it happen. And then, then we see these little signs and we're like, oh, that must be of you, God. I don't believe in coincidences, God. So therefore, if this happened and this happened and this happened, it must be you. I do believe in coincidences and I, I do believe that sometimes coincidences trip us. They trip us up. Because if we believe that there are no coincidences and we see some things that kind of fit together, we believe there's no coincidences. We believe that God is in everything. Sometimes we give God don't hate me for this, but sometimes we give God too much credit. We go, God, you've arranged all of these things. So this must be your overriding your word to us five years ago. Maybe I'm preaching too much. Let me get back into the word. So we're in Genesis chapter 16. And so Sarah said to Abraham, now, behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Let me stop again. She didn't say, God gave me a word that you're going to have my children with my maid. She said, it may be. Sarah was doing the same thing we do. Uh, I've got to make this relationship work. I have to get on this stage. It may be that God wants me to pull strings to make this thing happen, that he's already promised me. Sarah says, it may be. And if we take the word of God literally, she didn't even know. We do that, don't we? I can't point a finger at Sarah because I've done that. God's given me promises and I go out there and I do things to help God out that set me 10 years behind. How many of you have done that before? And it's painful to look back on it because let's face it, if you live to a ripe old age, to 80 or 90 years old, you only get 10 or eight or 10, eight or nine decades. Think about that. You spend two of those decades growing up. You spend another decade learning how to do things. So before you even grow into a real man or a real woman, you've already spent three of the decades. If you burn a couple more decades making mistakes, you don't have many decades left. And I've certainly done that before. I helped God out. It cost me a decade or two. She's helping God out. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So there it is. It's what we do. We, we take these coincidences. We think it may be that God is in this. We say, we're going to go fix this. We do the thing. And as soon as we've done it, we look back. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. Nine months ago, a year ago, Sarah was, you know what? I got this all figured out. Maybe God wants us to do this. Go do this. It seems like maybe she was okay with the sex. It was okay with conception. Well, it was, it was okay. The whole thing was okay. Until Sarah saw that Hagar was actually going to bear the promise. 
How many times do we do that? We've been praying and waiting for the promise for two years or five years or 10 years. And we get this idea and we're going to go fix it. And it's all good. We're getting everything in order. We're lining things up and it feels really good. And we're praying that God's going to help us. And we're standing on all the promises of God. We're standing on all the blessing promises. We're standing on all the move the mountain promises. We're standing on all the, if you just ask it in my name, I'll do it. We're standing on all those promises. And then as soon as we do the thing, we're like, oh my God, what have I done? Oh my God, what have I done? And that's what happened right here. Now, Sarah despised Hagar. I want you to note it. Note Hagar, from what we understand, Hagar didn't just seduce Abram. Abram didn't go to his wife and make this whole big old logical case. Sarah was the one that had this newfangled idea. But then once the deed was done, Sarah despised Hagar. Let's keep reading. This is verse five. So now Sarah says unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. Okay. She's admitting that she was wrong. We do that. I have given my maid unto your bosom. And when she saw, oh, you know what? I got this wrong. Her mistress was despised in her eyes. So she was despising, it, it sounds like it was going both ways. If we read this, it sounds like there was some despising that was going both ways. You can read it, let the Lord direct this, right? When she saw that she was, dis, that she was she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee, okay? So finally, Sarah goes to Abram now and says, the Lord judge between me and you. We got like a really messy family situation here. Regardless of which way the despicableness, the despising is going. How many of you have ever had a situation that when it develops, right? Maybe it's husband and wife, right? Maybe it's before, maybe it's after, maybe it's children are involved. Maybe there's money, there's business, there's a business partner. And it becomes like a three-way situation or a four-way or a five-way situation. It's, it's not simple anymore. You know, sometimes our sins are simple. You know, I do a wrong to you and, okay, we keep it. It's, it's, it's you and me. I do a wrong, I fix it. You do a wrong, you fix it. But sometimes I do a wrong to you and you do a wrong to me or husband and wife. You know, you do a wrong to them and they do a wrong back. And then there's something else and there's something else. And, and now to unravel this, it's not just a simple forgiveness. It's not just a simple, let me unravel this one small little thing. We can get on our knees and we can fix it, right? This was a mess. This was a real mess. It sounds to me like Hagar despised Sarah. Sarah despised Hagar. Abram's like, oh my God, why didn't I step into this? Why didn't I step into this and go, wait a second. Are you sure that's God's will? Right? Are you sure that that's God's will? Are you really sure? Are you committed to this? Are you committed to this forever? Are you sure that we want to change God's promise from whoever God has to us to whoever we make? And surely there could have been those conversations. We have those. The problem is right now, we have a really sticky mess. How many of you have had a sticky mess before? You've made it. Somebody else has made it. Then you've made it worse. God gets involved. The enemy gets involved. It's a real mess. It's not straightforward. It's a real mess. And so now Sarah says, the Lord, the Lord judge. We do that, don't we? We mess it up. Somebody else messes it up. We wrestle with it. And then we're like, oh God, you got to fix this. The Lord judge. God, you got to fix this. And sometimes God fixing it is not so easy. So now, now Abraham, I just have to laugh. This is some family drama. You could make a, a sitcom out of this. Now, Abraham says unto Sarah's wife, behold, your maid Hagar, she's in your hand. Do to her whatever you please. Do to her whatever you please. So Sarah comes to Abram, says, look, we messed everything up. It's horrible. Everybody despises everybody. The Lord get involved. The Lord judge it. Abraham says, look, I don't want any part of this. 
She's your handmaid. You gave her to me. She's pregnant. Look, Sarah, you take care of it. I'm going to go back out to the field and, and work. I'm going to work my business. I'm going to go out in my field and work the business. Sarah, you're in charge of the household stuff. She's in your household. You take care of her. And when Sarah dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. I want to be real honest with you. I've read this verse an awful lot of times. And I have always seen this verse as Sarah sent Hagar away. Now, I don't know if some preacher told it to me that way when I was 12 years old and I remembered it that way. I don't know if I've read it. I just made assumptions. How many of you make assumptions in the word of God? I do. I made an assumption right here. Sarah dealt heartily with her. She fled from her face. I always took that as, as Sarah sent her away, right? But verse seven says, so in verse six, she fled from her face. So Hagar fled. Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar. Now think about this. How unfair. Sarah had this, this, this harebrained idea that maybe we got to rush God along. And so Abraham, I think that you should sleep with my maid and we should have our son and we should raise this son up. She's going to be the surrogate mother and we should raise this son up. We're going to, God's awful slow right here. Maybe God got the words of his promise wrong. Let's go fix this thing for God. Okay. Get Sarah, gets Hagar involved. For all we know, Hagar didn't even want to be involved. But now Sarah turns on Hagar. How many times do we do that? We make a decision and then we make somebody else a scapegoat. Sarah turns on Hagar, deals harshly with her. Harshly. What, what fault so far in this passage, what fault does Hagar have in this? We have no evidence that Hagar's done anything wrong. None. No evidence. Not saying that it doesn't happen, but the word made it really clear here that Abraham and Sarah have a promise, but Sarah has taken things into her own hands. Abram is complicit, doesn't fight it. Verse seven, the angel of the Lord found Hagar by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. So Hagar takes off when Sarah deals hardly with her. Hagar's like, I don't want to put up with you. I'll go, I'll, I'm just going to take off. You are being too demanding. You, I don't, I'm done. I'm done. I give up. I leave. I'm running away. So she apparently she's pregnant and she runs away. And the angel of the Lord says to Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence came thou and whither will thou go? So the angels, the angels saying to her, this is a lot like God did in the garden of Eden. When he found Adam and Eve after they'd eaten the fruit, he comes and he goes, where, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? He's doing the same thing right here. Where are you? Where are you? Why are you here? You're supposed to be in the tent taking care of Sarah. You're her handmaid. What are you doing out here by the fountain? So Hagar says, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. Okay, now, let's stop here. Could God have said, Hagar, you've been involved in a real mess. Sarah's sinned, Abram's sinned, they didn't listen to me, they tried to take things into my, their own hands, they've done all these things wrong, I'm going to take care of you, I want you to move, I want you to go over here, I want you to go to a new city, I want you to find somebody to take care of you, um, I want you to, to start a business and take care of yourself, I'll take care of you, we'll raise a boy together, right, was that a possibility, absolutely, God could have done that, God does that with us sometimes, Verse nine says, the angel of the Lord said unto her, Hagar, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. So the angel of the Lord says, look, you've been dealt a harsh hand. You've been dealt a harsh hand by Sarah and Abraham's sin of trying to fix things on their own, trying to make my promise happen on, on their own. They've committed a sin. You have a bad situation because of your sin. So let me look at you, you folks in the eye. I look myself in the eye if I could right here, right? How many times 
have we run away or tried to run away, or maybe you're in a suffering right now. Somebody's being harsh with you. Um, I've got a wide audience. You folks will be listening on YouTube, so I don't know what the situations are. Some of you are in a bad uh, business situation. You have a partner that's defrauded you. You're in a bad relationship. You've got a husband that hasn't treated you well. You've got a wife that hasn't treated you well. You've got a you've got an ex situation that hasn't treated you well. You've got children that are treating you poorly. You've got parents that are treating you poorly. Um, you've got a country that's treating you poorly. You've got a, a how you've got a business associates. You've got people that have done business with you in the past. Somebody's treating you poorly. How many of you have somebody in your life treating you poorly? You probably all of us could raise our hand to that every single day of the year, right? Every single day of the year, somebody's treating us poorly. Okay, it just goes it goes along with life. And I think you add Christian in to this. We're following Christ. We're following Christ. The enemy wants to batter us so that we won't follow the Great Commission. The enemy just wants to batter us and push us down. And what better way to do it than through somebody yelling and screaming at us all every single day or lying to us or lying about us or cheating on us or or ruining our day or or whatever, right? What a better way for the enemy to get to your faith and destroy your faith than through somebody else, right? So let's look at Hagar now. That's what happened. Hagar Hagar has been mistreated the same way you and I have been mistreated. She's been mistreated bad. I mean, think about this. In today's world, Sarah and Abram would probably both go to jail for what they did to Hagar. Now, I know I know, culture was different back then, right? But in today's world, they'd both go to jail. Hagar's been treated really, really bad. Now, the angel of the Lord could have taken any promise out of the rest of the Bible and said, I'll be a husband to the widows. I'll be a husband to the forsaken. I will, I'll provide for you. If you'll tithe, I'll make you rich. You all, like, all, God, God could have done anything he wanted with Hagar, but the answer was submit yourself under her hands. I'm going to talk about that for just a minute. I had a pastor say this to me prob probably six months ago, not to me, it, it, it was to, an, to, to a group. He said that he, had, he was going through a tough situation a few years ago. It was a really bad situation. He was like, God, I, I just, this is horrible. Like, I don't want to go to work. I don't want to this. This is horrible, God. Can you please get me out of this situation? God, please, please get me out of this situation. What God told him was, I have spent years rearranging your life so that you can be in this situation so that I could teach you some lessons that you'll need. Imagine if Joseph, imagine if Joseph, when he was in Potiphar's house, had begged God to just take him out of the house. Look, God, I'm a slave. I'm a child of God. I'm a slave. I don't belong to be a slave. God, can I just run away? Can I please, can I just run away? If Joseph had run away, and, and I get that he ran away when, when Potiphar's wife grabbed his clothes, okay? But imagine if Joseph had been like, you know what, God? This woman, she keeps tempting me. God, it's going to be a problem one day. You see this, God, right? Like, you see this. Like, this is bad. What if Joseph had gone to God and said, God, I don't know if I can control myself. Come on, let's let's just look at you. You you've all been young before, right? Okay. What if Joseph had gone to God and just said, "Look, God, this this could go bad. Look, I'm strong and everything, and God, thanks for thanks for having a lot of faith in me. But you know, the truth of the matter is, God, I could be weak really one day, and I could really mess things up. You got this big promise for me, and the the ten stars and the sun and the moon, and you got this big promise, God." I think I need to run away, God. 
can you help me out? Can you help me make a go bag so I can just run away? I think I need to get out of Potiphar's house. God, can you, can you strengthen me to get out of Potiphar's house? The truth of the matter is, for some reason, God had Joseph stay in Potiphar's house. Now, obviously, when the heat of the moment came and Joseph's like, you know what? I may not be able to. He, he did run away. He finally ran away. And he did what was right and he ran away. And where, of course, when he ran away, he got caught. Then he got thrown in jail. And he could have been a bad prisoner. So we'll stop right there. Joseph submitted. Hagar was told by the angel of God to submit yourself. What if, th this is what struck me, folks. This may be the purpose of this entire message. There's probably a hundred purposes here. What if you in your suffering, what if God needs you in your suffering so that he can make you into the person that he wants you to be for something in the future? What if he is allowing your current suffering for his purpose? What if there's no way to make you fully into the man or woman of God that he wants you to be five years from now for another relationship, for another business, for another platform, to lead the country out of famine, whatever? And what if, what if the way that God has chosen to form you right now is through your current struggle? And what if you run away from your current struggle and the only way that God can form you into the person that he wants you to be is to give you another struggle 10 years from now to finish it off? What if? I don't know that. I, 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 I don't know that. But I can tell you this. I'll be honest. I, I can tell you this. I look back on my life and I look at some of the tests I have failed. How many of you, how many of you, none of us are spring chickens here. How many of you have failed a test in the past? I have. I failed some tests and I put both my hands up. I have failed some tests in the past. And is it possible that if I had not failed the tests in the past, is it possible if I had not run away from a prior suffering, then I wouldn't have to go through a current suffering? Is it possible? I want to speak something to you because I hear this in church far too much. I hear this in church, and I hear this on prosperity messages, and I hear this on motivational, Christian motivational messages too much. And we're just supposed to, we're just supposed to buck up. And, and we're just, we're just supposed to, you know, to, to do whatever it takes to turn our situation around and to cast that mountain out and to, to move through the mountain. And, and I've teached it before. I've taught it before. I've taught it before. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for it. But if God has placed that suffering in your life, I personally believe you've just got to go through it. You just got to go through it. And I'm going to open up some New Testament for you in just a moment. So that we're not just relying on one Old Testament passage. But I believe God's breathed life into this passage for us today. So I want to read kind of the rest of what happens. And then I want to get into some New Testament. So if anybody here is listening to me and they say, Sean, that's Old Testament. That's old stuff. It's all under the blood. We're going to fast forward past the resurrection in just a moment. But I want to finish this story out. So now, verse 10, the angel of the Lord said unto her, return unto your mis mistress and submit yourself under her hands. Okay. I just feel like I have to say this too. Submitting herself meant submitting herself possibly for the lifetime, for the rest of her life. Submit yourself. Because the submitting, the place of the submission was the birthing 
of what's going to happen next. Birthings happen in a dark place. Caterpillars become butterflies in a dark place. That cocoon is completely, completely covered. It's in a dark place. And if you pull the cocoon open, that caterpillar will die. The caterpillar and the butterfly, when that caterpillar becomes mush and then is turned into a butterfly, if you help the butterfly out, when the butterfly starts pushing it open, if you open it up for the butterfly, the butterfly will die. It'll never be able to fly. The reason is because the butterfly, the butterfly has to exercise its muscles to push the covering of the cocoon away. And the process of pushing the butter, the pushing the cocoon open, the process is what strengthens the muscles so that the butterfly can fly. I believe that for us, the process of pushing through our situation by God's power, once we're birthed, once we've been through birthing stage, once we've turned into the butterfly through the suffering, the process of climbing out is what strengthens our muscles so that we can be everything that God wants us to be. So now the angel of the Lord said unto Hagar, behold, you are with child. So she's still pregnant. And maybe he doesn't even know it yet or barely knows it. You're with child. I will multiply your seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, behold, thou art with child and thou shalt bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brothers. So basically what God is saying is, look, we have, I've have heard your affliction and I'm going to turn your affliction. I'm going to turn your affliction into a blessing. You've been afflicted. You've been violated. You have been forced to become someone's co concubine. You have been forced to become someone's wife. You have been violated. And then not only were you violated, but you were, you were, you were harshly dealt with so much. So you didn't think you could bear it. And so you ran to the wilderness because it was too much for you. But I have heard your cry. And even though this wasn't part of my original plan, my original plan was Isaac was going to birth, birth the, the lineage of Christ. But even so, I am going to hear, I'm going to hear you and I am going to give Ishmael his own lineage. I'm going to give Ishmael his own lineage and he's going to be wild and every man, and he will be against every man, and every man's hand is against him. Many people say that Ishmael is the father of so many of the Arabs that oppose Christianity. I haven't fully studied that out. I wasn't there. I haven't done the DNA research. I'm just saying that's what many say. The Bible says, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Who are the brethren? Isaac. Isaac. And that lineage. There's these two lineages. You know what? God could have taken that mistake and made that a miscarriage. God could have taken that mistake and sent them off to an island. God could have taken that mistake and done anything, but God took that mistake and he made that mistake into a kingdom, into a lineage, into a people, a huge people. That's what God did. And so she called, Hagar called the name of God that spake unto her, hey, thou God seest me, for she said, have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Verse 15, and Hagar bare Abram a son, and Hagar called his name son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bade bear Ishmael to Abram. So I want to stop the story there, and now I want to pop into the New Testament. 
We could go on and on with that story. If that story mimics or imitates what's been going on in your life, I just hope you'll get something from that. It, I have. I have. The Lord has given me ha, has given me great sustenance in that story and in many other things that he shared with me. But I want us to now turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, suffering, suffering was abolished by the re resurrection of Christ. OK, a lot of people will say this and they'll build a full theology on that. And, and, and that's OK. I don't, I don't want to disagree on points. I, I don't want to do that. I do want to remind us. I, I want to go to first Peter. I want to go to first Peter chapter th chapter three. And I want to just go to. I'm going to start in verse 16. We, we could start a little bit earlier. I just want to shoot right to the suffering, right? I just want to cut through the clutter. I'm going to shoot just right through the shuddering. The, the, and obviously we have Christ. He paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He's put everything in our life under the blood. He, you know, our, our money can be under the blood. Our suffering can be under the blood. Everything can be under the blood. Okay. But Peter is speaking to Christians He's speaking to Christians who are under the blood, just like we are. And Peter doesn't just say, pray that God takes it all away. Peter doesn't just say, move that mountain and it shall be gone. Peter doesn't say, you know what? I was in the garden when Jesus said to me, ask anything in my will and I'll do it for you. So go ahead, pray anything in my will and the suffering will be gone. Poof. Peter doesn't do that. I'm not saying that he couldn't have, but Peter doesn't. Listen to what Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Now, if I remember correctly, I did research on that word conversation in the past, and it means something connotation along the lines of like the life that you live, okay, kind of like um your character or, or the living that you live, your lifestyle, okay? So your good lifestyle in Christ. Verse 17, this is where it gets good and, and really gets into the suffering. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing, right? It'd be better for you to suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Peter didn't say, Peter didn't say, and cast that suffering away. He said, but it is better that you suffer. It is better that you suffer. I'm going to go backwards in verse Peter 3. Verse 13 says, who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? So he's asking sort of a rhetorical question. But then he says 14. We have to be so careful when we take one verse out of context. Verse 14, he says, but and if. Ye suffer for righteousness sake. Happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. Carrie, Thomas, anyone that's on YouTube watching this, if you're watching this down the road, if you suffer, if you suffer for righteousness sake, if you suffer because you've done right, if you suffer because you won't do wrong, if you suffer because you won't run away, if you suffer because you won't quit, if you suffer because you keep your eyes on Jesus, if you suffer because you won't run away from Potiphar's house, if you suffer because you won't quit the prison, if you suffer, if you suffer, for doing what God wants you to do, staying in the situation, perhaps. Happy are you, and do not be troubled because of their terror. Do not be afraid because of their terror, 
nor be troubled. What does Peter give as an answer? But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Who is he speaking to? People that might suffer. Don't take this verse out of context. This verse, Peter is speaking to people that if you suffer for righteousness sakes, happy are you, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I think a lot of times people take that verse, and I'm not saying that it doesn't mean this, but I think a lot of times we hear that verse. You know, in fact, this verse is used to suggest sometimes that you should study the word and be ready to give a, a reason for the hope of Jesus Christ that's in you. Be, be ready to preach the gospel. Okay, be ready in season and out. And that's in Timothy. It says be ready in season and out to give reason to the hope. But this verse right here in context says, be ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. What's the hope that is in you if you're going through suffering? The hope that Christ is forming himself in you while you're suffering and the hope that God, not you, but God is going to remove you from the, the suffering. So what, it, what is he saying right here? I feel inspired right now. I feel inspired by the Holy Spirit to say this right now to you. What he's saying is that as your suffering is going on, there is a hope being birthed inside of you, and you are expected to have a reason to be able to tell people the reason that you have a hope that is inside you from the suffering that is inside you, that God is crafting a hope and a reason for the future from that suffering that's going on inside of you. I just want to speak to you right now. Without the word, I've given you the foundation of the word. I want to share some things for you. I want you to, I want to wrap this up. If you're going through a suffering time right now, now, once again, I want to say, look, if God has commanded you to leave the suffering, if God has laid a path out before you, fine, take that path. God's word always supersedes anything that you hear from a television preacher, you hear from me, you hear from anybody else in your family. It always, it always supersedes that. But if you've been struggling to stay in your suffering and God is leading you to stay in your suffering right now, or if you're contemplating leaving and you haven't had any clear answer to leave your suffering, maybe you should stay right where you're at. Remember when I believe it was Paul was saying to people that if if you were if you became a Christian as a slave, stay a slave. And if you became a Christian as a free man, stay a free man. If you became a Christian in this particular situation, stay in your situation. Don't change anything. And once again, I'm not saying God doesn't direct you to leave. I want to be really careful that nobody overhears what I'm saying. What I'm really saying is keep your eyes on Christ. Don't go, don't go half cocked and go do your own thing. Do what Christ wants you to do. Beg him to be in his will every single day. Because if he's birthing, if you're in a cocoon situation and he is birthing in you, the ability like Joseph to be second in command of your country. If God is birthing in you a book, a story. You see, here's the thing. Whatever you're going through, what if 5 million people in this country are going through the same thing? How many of you have tried to find a book that will give you all the answers to your problems? There's a book out there for everybody else's answer. There's a best-selling book out there for everybody else's answer. But your deep answer there's no book. How about that? I've gone through something where I'm trying to find a book to, to take me through. There's 10 books that help me with each one of 10 little parts of my problem. The best of my knowledge, there's no book out there. And there's millions of people that are going through the same thing I've been through. The truth of the matter is I can't write a book for those 5 million people until I have the answers, right? Carrie, you can't write, I don't, know, I don't know if there's a book in you, okay? But, but because I don't want to speak that on to you. But I, you can't write a book about your struggle 
until you see it through and you have the solution. You can't write a book until you have the solution, Thomas. You can't write a book until you have the solution. And you're listening to me on YouTube. If you're in YouTube land and you're listening to me, you can't write your book until you actually have the solution. Joseph couldn't write the end of the story until he had his solution. Hagar, Hagar couldn't write the rest of the book until she had her solution. And for some of you, you can't be the solution until you've gone through your fire. You can't fully be the solution for millions of other people until you have completed your education. And if you run from your education prematurely, you'll never be able to write the book that God has in you. You'll never be able to build the platform God has in you. You'll never be able to be the speaker God has. You'll never be able to have the impact God wants you to have. Joseph would not have been able to impact the entire world and provide food for his brothers and mother and father if he hadn't gone through the full Potiphar time and the full prison time. If Hagar hadn't have been willing to go back when she'd birthed that child, it might have died in the wilderness and there would have been no Ishmael. There would be no Arabs. There would be no, no, there, no, and it, there would be something else, but it wouldn't have come through Hagar. Look, I want to encourage you to hang tough. I don't know what you're going through. And again, I don't want to ri override a word from God. If God gave you a word today to pack up your bags and leave, I'm not overriding that. But if you're trying to go, I want to look you in the eyes here. If you're trying, I believe this is inspired. If you're hearing me out, if you've sat through 55 minutes, most people quit far earlier than this on these videos. If you're hearing me out and God's been telling you to stay in, but your family's been telling you to quit. The psychologists have been telling you to quit. The books have been telling you to quit. The preachers have been telling you to quit. But God, that small voice has been telling you to hang in there just one more day, just one more day, just one more day. You can do anything for one more day. And when you wake up tomorrow, you can do anything for one more day. And when you wake up the next day, you can do anything for one more day. With everything I've got inside of me, and I don't have anything but what God's put inside of me. I'm looking you in the eyes right now. I'm looking you in the eyes right now. And I want to pour this into you. You do what God wants you to do. God's ready for you to quit. You pack up your bags and leave. When God's ready for you to fold your business, you pack up your bags and you fold that business. When God tells you to sell that business, you do it immediately. When God tells you what to do. But if God is telling you to hang in there for another day, if God is telling you that he's working on you to make you, make you into something for two years from now, I want to encourage you. I want to look you in the eyes and encourage you to hang in there. You read passage, you read that passage, of Hagar, Genesis 16, every day if you have to, morning and night. You read 1 Peter 3, morning and night. If that's what it takes, you hang in there and fulfill your suffering. I want to encourage you to do that. I'll give you what God's given me almost every single day that I can remember of for three or four years. God has had me read 2 Chronicles 20. I could probably give you play by play, almost word for word. It's not memorized, but I could get, I think I could get pretty close because he's had me read that almost every single day. And you know what? Almost every single day I get something new out of it. I don't know what your struggle is. And I'm not telling you to stay in. I'm not telling you in my natural to stay into it if it's unsafe. And I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you in my natural, to stay in it if it's not safe. And I'm not telling you that this word could turn tomorrow. And I'm not telling you that if God has placed something inside of you to leave, to leave. What I am saying is that if you've been begging God for the strength to stay, I want you to listen to this message as many times as you need to get the strength to stay and to fulfill your suffering. 
And if your suffering's over in 90 days or 30 days or nine years or nine months, and he tells you to leave, you'll enter a new season. And this, this voice, you'll no longer need this voice. Maybe he'll give you a new voice for someone else, or maybe he will speak something into you like he spoke this into me. I believe very strongly that God gives us words and we are expected to pass them through. God gave me this word for you. And Carrie, God might give you a word next week for someone else. And for any of you that feel like you can't go on Zoom and you can't publish things on YouTube because nobody shows up for your calls, two people showed up today. And for some of you, I didn't mean to do the balloons. Zoom does that when you give the victory sign. <laughs> All right. Um, for some of you, it's time for you to step up and stop just receiving and start giving. For some of you, it is time for you to share your struggle and to bless other people through your struggle. God blesses you to bless other people. You know, we pull that passage out of Corinthians about giving, that God gives you, God blesses you to bless other people. And we talk about that from a financial perspective, but God blesses you with insight so that you can bless other people. God has given me so much insight over the last 18 years in my business, but he didn't want it to stop inside of me. He wanted it to pass through. God has given me so much insight in my current struggle, but he hasn't given it so that it would stop up and be damned up inside of me. He's given it to me so it can pass through to other people. And so just as I've passed this message on to you, you should learn through it for today. But at some point next week, next month, next year, nine months from now, you should be birthing something out of your own experience. Because if God's birthing you to help a hundred people or a thousand people or five million people, he may not wait, want you to wait 10 years. He may want you to start sharing it one article at a time, one blog post at a time, one short YouTube video at a time, day after day after day after day. He may be passing a blessing through you onto other people. Father, I come before you right now and I want to pray first of all for Carrie and Thomas for hanging in there through this message. But I want to pray for them. God, I don't know what they're going through, what their struggle is. I don't know why you have them here. And maybe only you know. But Father, I lift up to you, Carrie. I, I ask that you will reach into her struggle and that you will give her the strength to make it through her struggle. And that every single day that you would bless her through her struggle that you would bless her, that you would strengthen her, that you would bring people into her life to strengthen her up, that you would bring voices into her life to counteract the negative voices, the negative toxic voices in her life. Father, that you would bring positive people into her life that would balance out those voices, that you would strengthen her to share your message, that you would strengthen her to be the voice that you are calling her to be. Father, I lift up to you, Thomas, and I know that I know that I know that you're birthing something in Thomas, and he may not even know what it is, but Father, I ask that you would birth that you would complete the birthing, that he would go through pregnancy, so to speak, that he would go through this, this caterpillar time, that he would go through this caterpillar time, that he would go through this cocoon time, and that he would do whatever is necessary with you, that he would draw close to you for an hour a day, that he would draw close to you for three hours a day, that he would draw close to you for three hours a day if necessary, every single day until he breaks through and maybe every single day afterwards because you are birthing something in Thomas. And now I speak to whoever's listening to the sound of my voice. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're Joe or Tom or Mary or Maria. I don't know who you are, but I want to speak to you. And I want you to imagine that God is speaking directly through me to you. And I don't know what your situation is, but if God has been telling you to hold on, hold on, don't violate God's word to you. If he's been telling you to hold on, you hold on. You hold on for one more day. If he's been telling you to learn through something through this, you learn something through this. If he's been telling you to get into his word for an hour a day, you get into his word. If he's been telling you to pray an hour a day, you pray for an hour a day. If he's been telling you to go into the wilderness for an hour a day, 
you go into the wilderness for an hour a day. And if he's been telling you to leave, you leave. If he's been telling you to pack up your bags and leave, you leave. If he's been telling you to start that business, you start it. If he's been telling you to quit that business, you, you quit it. If he's been telling you to get out of a sin, you get out of it. If he's been telling you to get on your knees, you get on your knees. Whatever he's been telling you to do, you do it. Because there is no excuse for not having obedience. The word tells us, I think in Samuel sometime, somewhere, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Whatever he's telling you to do, you do it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. As I wrap this up, don't walk away from this message. If this message meant a lot to you, listen to it again. You may have to listen to this message five times, or maybe there's another message somebody else poured into you last week and you heard it one time and you knew you should go back. Go back and listen to it again. Get into his word. You may need more than five minutes with God every day. You may need more than an hour of, of letting a preacher speak into you and an hour in his word and an hour with him personally. Sometimes we think that all we need, all we have is enough. I want to speak to some of you business people out there. You're working eight hours a day and you're banging your head against the wall and you're struggling. And you're scared to death if you work six hours that your business is going to fall apart. Well, look, if you're struggling, what matter does difference does it matter if you work six or eight? What if you spent two hours a day in prayer every single day? Is it possible that could, God could do more with six hours than you can do with eight? Is it possible that God can do more with five than you can do with eight? Is it possible that if you spent an hour a day in his word and you spent two hours a day just worshiping him, not begging him for Tim to do something, but just worshiping him, is it possible that just worshiping him, he could do more with five hours of your business day? Is it possible? Is it possible? I'm thinking of someone right now that's caretaking an older person. They have dementia. They have a dementia. The truth of the matter, it's taking care of somebody, dealing with somebody that has mental illness is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy dealing with somebody that's sick or you're, they're, they're bedridden or it's not easy. And let me tell you this, you got to get away sometimes. You got to get away. You got to find a friend that can come sit with you. Or, or you, you got to, you know, if you've been, if you've been struggling to say, look, I, I just don't want to hire. I feel like I'm feeling I'm letting the world down. If I hire somebody for a couple hours a day to come hold mother's hand, you know what? If she could talk, she would want that for you. You need to get away. You God, God did not make you to be a 24 hour caretaker for five years. Look, and I don't want to override what God may be doing, but, you know, I see so many people suffering sometimes when you really should find a way to just for an hour or two, get away with God, go for a walk, get away, spend time in his word, put on noise canceling earphones, ask for help, get help. There's so many situations and folks, if I haven't covered your situation today, find a way to cover it for yourself. Take that situation to God. There's no substitute for spending a couple hours a day with God every single day. I want to close this time with some worship. Father, I come before you right now. I just feel compelled in my heart to worship you. Father, I come before you and I worship you. I worship you, Lord. I just bring, I bring my current situation to you. Father, I don't have answers. I don't have answers. You told me through someone a couple months ago that you have it, that you've got it. But you know what, God, every day I work up trying to work, I wake up trying to fix it on my own. But God, why would have you told me you've got this if I was supposed to fix it? Father, I, somebody told me the other day to just pray, your will be done. I just want to be in the center of your will. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you. Father, I worship you. You're a good God. You own all the cattle on a thousand hills. You know every human relationship inside and out. And you don't want any of us to be in bondage to abuse. We're childs of God. We're, 
We're sons of God. We're daughters of God. And as daughters of God, you don't want any of us to suffer and endure abuse for no reason and no purpose except by your divine plan. You will give us strength to get through anything. God, you don't want our businesses to suffer and fail year after year after year. But sometimes you'll allow us to suffer for a season in our business. You don't want us to be in a dysfunctional relationship forever, but for a season, maybe we have to learn something. Sometimes we have to get help. We have to get counsel. Proverbs tells us, the wise man gets counsel, and I'm not quoting, but it's in there. Father, I worship you. I love you, Lord. I worship you. I thank you for your presence in my life. I thank you that from the time that I wake up until the time that I go to bed, you're right there with me every single day. I thank you that you're with me. You're not just some spirit that I bring into action when I need help. But you're there all day long, whether I'm asking for your help or not. You're all day long. Father, I worship you. Father, I ask that you'll give me strength to walk through my present trouble. And now I lift up to you, Carrie, and I ask that you will give Carrie strength to walk through her present trouble and to walk away when you tell her it's time, but not a day too soon. And Father, for every minute, for every hour that you require, that you beg carry to get help to go through her current struggle that you will give her the strength and that might mean an hour a day with you that might mean an hour in the morning an hour at night and an hour in the, in the evening daniel turned his heart and prayed to you morning noon and night even though he was going to be thrown into the lion's den he knew what the punishment was and yet he turned to you three times a day Paul told us to pray without ceasing. God, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I still don't know. But Father, I do believe that between every word I say to someone else, I can breathe a prayer. Father, I breathe a prayer right now. Lord, be with me. Lord, be with me. Sometimes that might be praying in the spirit. Father, I love you. And I lift up to you, Carrie's situation. I don't know the details, but you do. You're the God of all comfort. You're the God of all wisdom. And sometimes you help people through other people. Sometimes you help us through therapists or counselors or godly counselor or Christians or non-Christians or believers or non-believers, ordinary people in the grocery store. You lead us through your word. You lead us through a YouTube we watch. Father, I ask that you'll comfort her. I lift up to you, Thomas. Father, I lift up to you, Thomas, in his business. I lift him up to you in his business. Father, you've done so much in Thomas in these last years. You've taken his experience and you've multiplied him multiple times. He can help so many more businesses he couldn't two years ago because he has all this great new experience that's only happened through the fire. I lift him up to you, Thomas's marriage. I just ask that you continue to strengthen his marriage. That as they go through tough times, they go through tough times financially, as they go through tough times individually, as she goes through tough things personally that Thomas can't help her with. And as that Thomas goes through tough things that, that she can't really help him with. But God, that they would come together and they would be strong for each other. And that they would recognize that Thomas's weaknesses Thomas's weaknesses don't have to be her cross and that her weaknesses don't have to be his cross, that God gave each of us two bodies for a reason, that he gave us boundaries for a reason, that we're not supposed to be, that we're, we, we're, not, we're not supposed to be meshed in with the other person so tight that the other person can't think for themselves. Father, I ask you bless that marriage. Father, for anybody else, it's here for anybody that's hearing the, the sound of my voice. I don't know what they need, but God, I ask that they'll lean into this and that they'll get, give strength from you. Father, I reach out my hand right now to anybody that's listening to this as a, as a recording later, that they would get as much strength from this 
as the humans here that are here physically, God, I don't feel like quitting. I, I just want to keep on going right now because I feel like some people, some people are gaining from this. And Father, I just want to be your conduit. I just want to be your conduit for your power and your spirit. I ask that you'll, you'll pour your spirit through me, not of me, but through me, that you'd pour your words through me to others. Pray, folks, pray with me. Father, we worship you. We love you. Pray this prayer for yourselves. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. You're my rock. You're my defender. You're my provider. You're my provider. You're my comfort. You're right there. I don't fear. Not because you're going to solve it tomorrow, but because you're right there. I'm not dismayed, not because you're going to take the problem away, but because you're right there. And maybe you will fight that battle for me, or maybe you will give me the strength to fight it. But Father, just say after me, folks, God, you're awesome. God, we love you. God, we draw close to you. Lord Jesus, give me strength. Lord Jesus, may your blood wash over my sins. Lord Jesus, may your blood cover my money. May your blood cover my mistakes. May your blood cover the nasty words that I've said to other people that have pushed them away. May your blood cover my marriage. May your blood cover my relationships. May your blood cover my business. May your blood cover. Folks, just say that to the Lord, whatever your trouble is. Lay it down at the feet of Jesus. Lay your trouble down at the feet of Jesus and don't take it back. Lay it down. Let him have it. Let him have your struggle. He's stronger than you. Let him have your trouble. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Thankfully, folks, pray this again and again. Hit rewind five, just five minutes. Pray this again and again until your spirit feels it and it's clear. Pray it again and again. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray thankfully.